Hello, this is Chris with GoodTube Kids. And for those that are out there in GoodTube Kids, you uh, may not know just how important Christian apologetics has been to me. And Christian apologetics, uh, you can't really say it without the name Dr. William Lane Craig. And this is a, a philosopher, a theologian, an apologist, and a, a, a man who has been somebody I could follow behind on stand on his shoulders uh, with reasonable faith in his ministry. And we have him today on our podcast. I am so thankful. Hello, Dr. Craig. How are you? Hi, Chris. Great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. You know, for many of those, anybody listening on the reasonable faith side of the platform, they're going to know who you are. Uh, but for those out there uh, on the Good Tube Kids side of the platform, they may not have heard of you before, may not know uh, much about you. So I'm going to give a little bit of a formal introduction. Dr. William Lane Craig is a visiting scholar of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Christian University. And he and his wife, Jan, have two grown children. Uh, Miss Jan, a wonderful woman who I've gotten to meet who supports him wonderfully. At the age of 16, as a junior in high school, he first heard the message of the Christian gospel and yielded his life to Christ. And Dr. Craig pursued his undergraduate studies at Wheaton College and graduate studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where he received two masters. And then the University of Birmingham, England, where he had his a PhD in the University of Munich, his doctorate in theology. He's authored over 30 books, and these are substantive books. Uh, these these aren't just light reading, uh, but they are approachable. And Dr. Craig was named in 2016 by the best schools as one of the 50 most influential living philosophers, and humbly, I would say, of all time. You know, uh, Dr. Craig, <clears throat> your ministry, Reasonable Faith, has just, it, it's worldwide, isn't it now? Yes, it really is. It's reaching all over the globe, and every month we have over 3 million engagements on our various platforms. And those are not mere clicks. Uh, these are people who watch a video, comment on an article, like uh, a video, or read a, a, a question of the week, something of that sort. Over 3 million engagements every month. And so the Lord is using this ministry to touch lives all across the uh, globe. You know, Dr. Craig, I, I read the snippets. Uh, obviously, I follow along with what's going on with Reasonable Faith, and I read the snippets of, like you said, people writing in and saying, this yeah. has changed my life. Uh, I first came about your work. Um, I was an FBI agent, and for those who are listening on the Reasonable Faith side, you, you probably don't know who I am at all, and that's fair. Um, I, I started a company called Good Tube Kids, and, and we're a ministry as a business that's creating a safe place online for youth. Um, our youth are just under an onslaught of, of lies and mistruths, half-truths, and we need to protect what's getting fed to them. Uh, but that all is anchored in the fact that there is truth. You know, that's, that's one of the things that Reasonable Faith Focus on is the, the, the truth that exists. And uh, I was an FBI agent working counterterrorism uh, in Texas. And I was studying extremist Islam, and in some of the things I was reading, they were writing uh, about what the Christian faith believes. You know, they, they believe this or that. And I said, that's not true. But I couldn't form a coherent, cogent argument. And I said, how do I form an argument? Because I knew it wasn't true, but I just couldn't make the response. Not that I was dialoguing with them, but it just in my own mind. And so here I was, I found Reasonable Faith, I found the Defender series. If you're looking for really a free master's education in, in apologetics, you can go to Reasonable Faith, you can find the Defender series, your work, Dr. Craig, and I, I as they say in mo modern day, I binge watched it. I just lis listened to, I listened to every episode, every one of the series, and, um, there I was, now now beginning my journey as a young apologist, and look, here we are now, sir. Yes. Yes, and you've been a Reasonable Faith chapter director in Alaska, mm -hmm. uh, and we've really appreciated your help and input. Well, thank you so much. You, you know, like I said, my background is in law enforcement. I, I spent 19 years in law enforcement, and the last 14 years of my career were in the FBI, and I've worked terrorism and intelligence, and I've worked white collar. But one of the things as an investigator, uh, reasonable faith really appeals 
uh, to those, like you said, doctors and lawyers, engineers, investigators, the people who like to put together and think systematically about these things. So if you like to think about these things or you want to find those answers, I recommend you go to Reasonable Faith and find it there. But I say it's unfortunate and unfortunate I found out about apologetics at 31. Fortunate because I found what I believe is, you know, one of God's calling in my life to work in this realm. But why was I 31 before I'd heard about it? You, you, what, what, what do you think? Why, why are adults just now finding out about this? I, we, we've done a disservice to our yeah. youth. Go yes, ahead. I think that the problem here is that our pastors who go to seminary to get an education are trained for the professional ministry in things like preaching, church administration, uh, and other professional duties. And I'm afraid that interest in apologetics is simply not a priority in the seminary education of your typical pastor. And that is then in turn reflected in the churches that these men lead. And I, I find this is especially true with youth pastors who seem to be focused upon entertainment and emotional worship experiences rather than really training their kids in Christian doctrine and the defense of the faith. So I think there is increasing hunger among the laity for this kind of training. I think that's one of the effects of the so-called new atheism spearheaded by Richard Dawkins and his ilk. Uh, this has awakened a real hunger among the laity for training of this sort. And so it's interesting to see that this movement is not coming from the top down. It's not being initiated by the pastors and ministers, but it's their lay people who are demanding um, more training in this area. You're, you're right. Uh, one thing you said about our youth pastors and our pastors, and I've heard you say this before, is they're also overwhelmed. Yes. They're, they're trying to take care of so many things and then just trying to get the kids to the church. And so much like, you know, some of the public school classrooms where you have some kids who are there and really want to learn, other kids you're having to beg to come to class. And so you're not able to feed everybody the way you wish you could, uh, I think, at times. And so pizza parties and, and those things uh, seem to rise to the surface just to hold the youth. But if we don't train our youth... Um, I, I would say, look at the status uh, of society now. Look, look what's happening as a result of the loss of truth. Uh, I, would, would, you, would you say there's a strong correlation there between that sort of loss of objectivity and this now just culture of whatever you say goes? Yes, I do think that there is a kind of relativism or pluralism that pervades Western culture. It looks at matters of religion and ethics as subjective matters of personal preference and feeling, whereas it looks to science and technology and medicine for the objective truth about reality. And as a result, claims of Christianity are regarded as just true for you, but not true for me, and easily dismissed. And and that's a really dangerous thing. The the when we move to true for you but not true for me, and then when youth absorb that, um, a mis a misguided understanding of tolerance, then yeah. it's easier to fall away or walk away from the faith because you haven't really walked away from anything sub substantial. You you know, Doctor Craig, I, I want to play a clip here. It was an interview you did about eight months ago at a church in Houston. And in that church, you, you really succinctly and really well addressed the problem uh, of youth uh, and, and not giving them a proper, solid education in apologetics. I'm going to go ahead and pull it up here. And I, I just think that this, this explains so well the threat of not properly educating our youth. 
What do you think is at stake for, for churches and why should churches spend time in investing mm. resources and time with, uh, with, in apologetics, local churches? Yes, there are a number of reasons that could be given for this, but to cut to the simplest reason, I think, is if we don't do this, we're going to lose our youth. Mm. Uh, our kids in high school and university are under a barrage of criticism uh, overwhelming naturalism and secularism combined with uh, relativism about ethics and religion. And quite honestly, if we do not, from a very young age, teach our children the rational foundations for faith, then increasingly they're going to walk away from it in high school and university. So for the sake of your own children, uh, I would implore you yeah. to study apologetics and to teach it to your children simply at first and then with increasing depth as they grow older. Amen. And uh, a verse you allude to often in your debates and one that's meant a lot to me is from uh, 1 Peter 3. And if you're ever looking for a reason biblically to, to learn how to offer a defense of your faith, this is it. I mean, 1 Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect. Yes, and the word there for answer is apologia. Is that right? Which connotes a defense, as in a court of law, to present a case yeah. for the truth of the Christian worldview. Yeah. What a powerful statement, Dr. Craig. Mm. We're going to lose our youth. You, you know, I, I, for those who don't know, I, I resigned from the FBI in January of this year um, there are two reasons. One, uh, we're having our own issues in the FBI, but aside from that, I believe that the greatest threat to our youth is the war for their hearts and minds that's taking place in the digital realm. Uh, how much more dangerous is it? So parents are so ready to fight for their children, right? You're never going to take your, my child out of my hands willingly. But the Pied Piper of lies that comes across on YouTube and Nickelodeon in these in these shows and then one day they just walk out from under our nose they they've been lied to this whole time and so we launched this company good tube kids to be a safe place for kids and a resource for parents in that youth can go on and they parents can subscribe them to our platform and you never have to worry about what they might see I don't think parents really realize what is happening what is happening in this Colosseum of ideas and what's being fed to their youth in fact we wrote an ebook called poison candy about that danger. And we're seeing our youth be negatively, they're real casualties. There are real casualties in this war, um, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, as as we're seeing uh, played out in the culture. And so I think your words are so accurate. Um, so then what do we do not now, though? I think that's the question. And how do we get youth trained uh, in, in this? I think parents are a bit intimidated. What, what would you say to the yes. parents? I think that the parents, first and foremost, need to educate themselves in Christian doctrine and apologetics before they try to teach it to their children. I have an uneasy suspicion that a lot of parents think, yeah, this is really good material for my kids. I, I want the youth pastor to, to train them in these things so they can defend their faith. But they themselves don't know any arguments for God's existence, couldn't lay out a case for the historicity of the Gospels. I think that a lot of parents are themselves in what I call intellectual neutral and not really intellectually engaged with their faith. And if that's the case, then what do they model for their kids? And how do they train their kids if they themselves aren't engaged intellectually with these issues. So the very first thing is that parents need to learn to become um, learners, readers, uh, to be ingesting the kind of material that we're talking about. And then, particularly fathers, fathers are the one who need to take the lead here, not the mom. The father needs to then share this material with his children simply when they're they're small 
but then with increasing sophistication as they grow older, so that these children know that dad is sold out to Jesus Christ and that he has good reasons for believing what he does. It's not just emotional, and that the, the child will then absorb this from the parents. Now, of course, if the youth pastor is also engaged, all the better. I, I, that would be wonderful, but you can't depend on him. You, you can't just punt to the youth pastor and expect him to carry the ball. You've got to do it at home in the family first and foremost. You know, I, I just preached a sermon uh, this about a week or two ago. It was called Raising Mavens. And I was I did some work with Brett Kunkel and his group Mavens. And the idea of a maven being this ex expert in a field. And I asked, are we trying to be mavens ourselves as adults in, in our Christian faith? And then are we raising mavens? Are we preparing our youth? I give an example uh, from an active shooter. Unfortunately, it's something we're all familiar with. But when I was in SWAT with the FBI, we trained for active shooters. And one of the things that we always did is when you're moving down a hallway, imagine, unfortunately, in a school or building, you stand side by side with your brother uh, in arms there, uh, who's got armor, a rifle, and you're ready to take on a threat. But if you're getting somebody in or out of the building that you need to protect, you put them behind you. Hmm. Right? So Because they're not ready to fight that fight yet. And our youth need to be behind us. They're not ready to just take on every idea. They need to be trained. And yes. then one day they can start to stand shoulder to shoulder with us. And so an open phone, an open screen, I'm telling parents, is just as dangerous uh, as a car or uh, somebody with an, who's untrained with a firearm. Because it, it can, if it ruins your mind, uh, we have lost so much more. And it's particularly in the realm of our faith. Uh, there, there are eternal consequences at, at, at stake here. So... Parents have to admit that there's a problem, and then, like you said, get engaged. Now, I want to highlight a few things. You said um, about uh, fathers teaching their children, and sometimes parents don't have just it in their mind, and so they're looking for resources. And so here are a few of the things that I've read to my own son, some of your books. Can you tell me a little bit about oh. this book for children? Yes, this was a series of 10 booklets on the attributes of God that I wrote for our own children, for Charity and John. And I never dreamt that it would be published someday, but um, it was on the main attributes of what God is like. God is everywhere. God is uh, forever. God is all-knowing. God is all-loving. God is three persons. And this a series of booklets will expand the child's mind to think of God as so awesome, so far beyond what he imagined. God is not like a man with a long white beard sitting on a throne of heaven. He's an almighty, eternal, necessary, all-powerful being who uh, directs the universe. And to give the child this majestic picture of God, I think, is tremendously bracing and, and strengthening. And the booklets are written in such a way that they provoke wonderful conversations with your children. So many parents have told us that when they read the books to the children, the children would then ask questions in turn about the nature of God and what it means to be all-powerful or all-knowing. And many times uh, the parents found their own faith and understanding stretched by thinking about these attributes of God. And so this was a series that I used with our own kids. And many years later, we hired an artist, uh, Marley Tigg, to illustrate the book with these lovable cartoon characters and then self-publish these uh, through uh, Amazon. So I, I think it's, they're wonderful books. I've read them to my son a, a number of times over. And one thing you said, though, is when parents are reading these books, there's going to be questions and discussion. And a recommendation to parents is it's okay to say, I don't know, 
let's look it up. Let's explore this because not only can you teach your youth from the books, but then you can show them how to explore their faith. You can show them that it's yeah. okay not to know. I, what I always try to teach people in apologetics is when you walk away, you're not going to remember all of this that we said. Just know that there are answers. So when you get stumped, know where to go. You know, if you if you, if you break your arm, you go to the doctor. If you <laughs> if your car doesn't work, you go to a mechanic. If you have a question in this realm, go to an apologist. Go to the resources that are out there. And like your website, Reasonable Faith, they can find so many resources. Um, now, for older youth who or and or parents who are entering this realm, so by when I say kids, I think sometimes people think only toddlers or only seven-year-olds, but our tweens and teens are still kids. Uh, they still need, in fact, more so, I think, our guidance. And so you have this book, On Guard. Could you just tell us a little bit about, about that one? Yeah, On Guard is, a, is intended to be like a primer for beginners. It's an elementary introduction to the defense of the faith that focuses on giving good arguments for God's existence, answering the toughest arguments for atheism, and then giving good arguments for the person and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so a person who absorbs the arguments in this book will be equipped to answer the questions with probably 95% of the people that he encounters who have never thought about these things in any depth uh, at all. And so this is, a, it, it's been described as a Swiss army knife. Uh, this book is just chock full of all kinds of things to help the beginner to defend his faith. Well, if, uh, if that's the Swiss army tank, I'd have to say that Reasonable Faith is the uh, M1 Abrams of, yeah. of books here. This is, this is a tank coming along, but um, it's a book I've read more than once uh, in order to prepare. But this is what kind of enables you as, a, as the start point for starting a Reasonable Faith chapter. So if you, can you tell me a little bit about, about your thoughts on this? Sure. When I became a seminary professor myself in philosophy of religion, one of the courses that I was called upon to teach seminarians was apologetics. And reasonable faith was my lectures in apologetics. I, I basically published the lectures so that students would need to take notes. And since that time, it's gone through a second edition and now in a third edition, each time expanded and updated to uh, make it current and uh, relevant. Uh, so reasonable faith is for people who have a university education, basically. This one's not for beginners. It's more of an intermediate level textbook uh, on apologetics. Again, focusing on the existence of God and his self-revelation in Jesus of Nazareth. Well, we highlight a lot of these works regularly under our good book section and our network resources section uh, for parents and for youth. But these are books and a lot of activity is happening in the digital realm. Uh, a yeah. lot of things are absorbed and, and not negatively. There's, there's a very powerful uh, opportunity in the digital realm. And so for those who are listening on the reasonable faith side of the house, I, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Good Tube Kids. Like I mentioned earlier, Good Tube Kids was launched when I, my son got bit by YouTube. Uh, I think more, more and more kids are getting what I call bit by YouTube. They saw something they shouldn't have seen. In fact, the average age to see pornography now is eight years old. It's often happening at school. Um, and not only that, but I think you would attest, Dr. View, that it's, it's really important what the world view is of the person putting together the media because that's going to guide what the what they think is good um and so youtube and some of these other once trusted media institutions they've really gone far astray from uh the christian world view and so y your children just really i mean aren't safe and i have i think good evidence to prove that so we created good tube kids as a brand new platform for youth kids, tweens, and teens to watch videos. 
and Reasonable Faith has some excellent videos. Tell me a little bit about the Zang Meister videos mm -hmm. that were created. A, a few years ago, we saw an animation that the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had done, and it was so sharp and substantive as well. And we contacted the animator, found out that he loved Reasonable Faith, and he left the Billy Graham Association to come to work for Reasonable Faith and began to animate or develop these animated videos, which are based upon the chapters in the book On Guard. And so there is a video, for example, on the meaning of life. There's one on why does anything at all exist. There's one on the beginning of the universe. There's one on the design of the universe. There's one on the objectivity of moral values. Uh, there are uh, animated videos on the person of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. And so for those who don't like to read, which is unfortunately far too many uh, students these days, these animated videos provide five to six minute clips of these arguments uh, boiled down to the bare minimum. And even though they're entertaining, they're really well done. They are substantive as well. I, I've guaranteed by my own review of these videos, that they have intellectual substance and credibility, even as they are simple, entertaining, and easy to grasp. So those are the, the Zangmeister videos that we at Reasonable Faith have developed. Well said in that they are, they are short yet powerful. It's often hard um, when I want to describe a topic like the uh, moral argument to beat what they've done with these Zangmeister videos because the the interplay of the images yeah. um, and the voiceover and the lists that come out, it's hard. It, it would be hard pressed to be able to do that all just verbally. Uh, and so I've shown them to youth. I've shown them to many youth groups. I've shown them to many um uh, many to, oh, my son, I think, has seen all of them. But one of the problems we have, particularly with youth groups and churches, and I, I say on YouTube, where a lot of these videos lie, uh, they're also found on Reasonable Faith there. You can watch them directly there as well uh, if you search. But uh, I, I tell parents, you are one click from disaster on, mm -hmm. on YouTube, unfortunately. I say that YouTube is like gold in a minefield. It's sometimes it's just not worth it for our youth to be on there. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with the dangers, follow us at Good Tube Kids to learn more. But in that vein, I said, why, when my son got bit by YouTube, I said, why can't there just be good tube? <laughs> good, and then there started. <laughs> there was Good Tube Kids. We we uh, it, it was a seed that the Lord planted in my heart and. About a year and a half later, I, I, I resigned early from the FBI. I resigned eight years before retirement. Never thought I'd leave a 19-year law enforcement career. But this is this is the most important battle. And if not me, then who? If not now, then when? And so I had to get into the fight. And so working with you, Dr. Craig, and Reasonable Faith, we were able to get those videos on our subscription platform for Good Tube Kids. And in fact, I want to show folks a little bit about what we're doing over there. Now, Good Tube Kids is two things, a safe place for kids and a resource for parents. And we have created a, a website that you can now come over and you can find everything you're going to need here in one place. We want to be that easy button. You can learn about what we're doing. You can sign up. You can find out about what your kids are being shown in the culture. And so not only do we want to talk about the problem, but we want to provide a solution. And that's what we did by creating the GoodTube Kids platform. Every video there is hand-picked by us. And so we have now, a, a, I can't believe it, we just got our apps out on Apple and Android, and we have 11,000 minutes of content from folks like Reasonable Faith, which I want to focus on here. And that is, you have allowed us so graciously to host these videos on our platform and in doing that, we now have all 17 videos that your youth can see uh, right right there at a click. 
I, I could easily watch the entire video, um, yeah. as I've done a number of times. They start to kind of bring you in, especially the voiceovers. Uh, I, I like yeah. the uh, diversity of voices there. But Yes. Yeah, one of the things that we decided to do was to use native English speakers from different countries. Mm -hmm. So you've got Irish, you've got Scottish, you've got British, you've got South America, or, uh, South African, uh, and these are wonderful voiceovers because of these accents. They are, and as um, I've seen in debate, sometimes they just sound smarter. I don't know how they do it, but they I just know. sound they just sound smarter. <laughs> but so we've seen now there are plenty of resources. So the excuse is no longer there's not enough resources. There are books, there are videos, there are free resources, there are. Uh, GoodTube Kids, uh, where you, you can uh, pay to have a safe access to these resources. The, I guess one of the questions would be, I, and I think I know the answer, is Christian theology and apologetics too complicated to be taught to our youth? Oh, no, I, it, it's not. And I think that the What Is God Like series illustrates that with the brown bear and the red goose and their two little children. Uh, these difficult concepts can be made simple and taught even to small children. And then, of course, as they grow up, then you can unfold these doctrines with increasing sophistication. But it's demonstrably possible to teach these truths to small children, as these booklets illustrate. So then, I, what we're really trying to do, I think, is encourage parents that they have to take um, I'm trying to think of another metaphor, but the one that always comes to mind is they have to get in the fight. We have to fight mm -hmm. for our youth and preparing them uh, just like we would for battle, but mentally uh, to enter into this, I, I say, the yeah. Colosseum of ideas. And so then, go ahead. And my emphasis, Chris, is that to prepare your kids for the fight you yourself have to be mm -hmm. self-prepared first. You've mm -hmm. got to educate yourself in Christian doctrine, Bible contents, uh, apologetics, so that you yourself are intellectually engaged. Uh, and then you model this for your children. I, You know, I think that's, I, I forget to make that correlation as, as clear as you just did, but, you know, if I'm going to teach my son... Um, how to use uh, a rifle. Right. Uh, I first need to know how to use a rifle. And so I I, I just think parents need to take ownership. Uh, one thing I was talking about in my sermon was people, parents, we often say we don't have enough time. Uh, and I would say a good evaluation of our screen time ourselves would likely say something different. If we, if we looked at mm just what videos or what are we listening to when we're working or driving or working out? Because those Defender series, they're free. There's videos, there's audio, and there's um, it's written out. So there's no excuse for not having access. Uh, and that sounds harsh to parents. And so I want to make sure, like you said, it's the mother and father who are ultimately responsible for the education of their of their children. And look what your your talks to your kids have now created these books uh, that, yeah. that are available. So then what order, though, because parents, I think, try to, we, we just make lists. We, you know, we're trying to figure out my son's got to go to this, or my daughter's got to go to these things. So in relation to going on missions or evangelism or daily Bible reading, prayer, yes, is, is it um, a zero, like a, a diminishing sum game where you have to say apologetics is third or it's first, or are we able to actually weave that into all of those things? <laughs> well, no, I, I do think it's it's probably third rather than first. I think first, with young children, you start off by teaching them the Bible. And the best way to do that, in my experience, is to get one of these picture Bibles that is illustrated like a comic book. Uh, and you read one of those stories every night after supper. And this, again, is something that you fathers need to do. Don't, don't abdicate this to the mom. The father needs to sit down with the children on the couch, one on each side of him or whatever, and read to them out of the picture Bible. 
and then have a prayer with them afterwards. And that would be the most elementary. And, and the priority is to familiarize them with Bible content. And then from that, I would say you go on to teach them Christian doctrines. And that's what the series, What is God Like?, aims to do, to, to give them an, a vision of who God is and the greatness of God so they don't think that God is just some sort of a man in the sky or a, a man upstairs, but God is this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, eternal, uh, omnipresent creator. Give, stretch their vision of God. Uh, and then, finally, third, would be where you begin to help them to give reasons for what they believe. And this will probably come fairly naturally in response to what you're teaching them. They'll, they'll probably raise objections or say, I heard someone say this at school, or well, why, why should we think that there is a God? And that's then the opening that you need to begin to give some positive evidence and arguments. I think that's a that's a good exploration into the idea that we're not trying so much to just shelter our children. Uh, rather, we are exposing them to our counter arguments and claims yes. in a safe environment so yes. that they can learn how to handle um, those before it it's you know it's a punch in oh, the face uh, in I college. I couldn't agree more with you, Chris, about that. This is not about sheltering. On the contrary, it's about exposing them to what our secular culture uh, has to say and wants them to believe, and how best to respond to it. So then, I, I think as we look at our younger children, you know, we we want to make. Uh, our faith. And that's what one thing we want to do at Good Tube Kids and one thing you said there. I too often they're taught that their faith is here and their sports are here, their academics are here, their hobbies are here, and so every Sunday they come back to this circle and then throughout the week they go back to these. It mm. is the foundation for then everything we do. Uh that that's how I want my son to know about his his faith. Uh yeah. and that it's interwoven. So when we're watching, you know, there's so many beautiful areas of, of apologetics where you're watching a TV show or that commercial pops up and you can explain why is that worldview incompatible with the, the Christian worldview? Or, um, hey, my teacher told me this uh, in the scientific realm. Well, let's explore that. And how does that uh, interplay with our faith? So apologetics doesn't have to be uh, that's what we do Tuesdays at between three and four for homeschool, or uh, that's only what we do on you know Saturday mornings. It can be all the time. It doesn't have to be so focused um, mm -hmm. in the sense that it 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 is a period of time. It it can come about beautifully organically in our conversations as long as parents are willing to engage and have done some work themselves. Uh, otherwise, yeah. you won't know how to how to play it out. And and so speaking then to parents. Sir, um, for those who feel intimidated, maybe they, they, they've accepted that there is a problem, or, and I, I would call it a threat. There is a threat towards our youth, and we need to train them. Our, our adults feel like I'm behind the curve. I need to get uh, training myself. What do you do now? Like I, I want to both train my child. I don't have time, I feel like, to spend, let's say, six months or a year. I, I want to do both at the same time. How do you recommend they go about doing something like that? Well, it depends on the age of the child, obviously. But in terms of their own self-education, I'd really encourage them to begin with some simple books like Lee Strobel's book, Case for Christ, or my own book, On Guard. If they will digest that material, and I mean not just read the book, Chris, not just read the words, but digest and absorb that material, memorize the arguments, make them their own, then they will be confident and equipped to deal with, as I say, about 95% of the uh, objections that they'll encounter in our culture. 
you you know digesting the material is is such an important idea yeah. because uh we so we're so used to now and particularly the algorithms on media and they just want to throw content at you long enough to hold your eyeballs uh they just want you to kind of passively receive but when we're working through these books um it's not a leisurely read we want to be involved right. we want to you know, it's something you want to do first thing in the morning when you're mentally focused and, and you can read that chapter and understand it's okay to walk away and say, what What did that mean? Why? I need to read this. I need to read this again. I read your book, Time and Eternity, and I had to stop, read a few more books on relativity, come back to it. So um, I think for all, all as, a, as a parent, as, as a young apologist, you know, you look at Dr. Craig and you think, look at all his education. As I, I want to tell the parents out there, I'm where you are, right? I, I am somebody who was in a different career, a different profession, and I realized you know, how beautiful the truth of the Christian faith was, and I also realized how important it is that I train my child. You know, If, if our kid gets into college, they get a great job, they're making uh, a, a lot of money and all that, but they don't know the gospel, it's all for naught. What, what have we done? Would would you have though? And let's go back to the parents or youth. Do you have any cautions for them to when they begin to study apologetics? Particularly, I, I heard you talk about, you know, they think I'm going to study apologetics, so I'm going to first start by reading oh. all of the Four Horsemen's books uh, first, and then I'll read. Or do you see what I'm saying? I think I do, Chris. And if I discern the direction you're going, it would be related to what you said earlier about kids searching YouTube and finding destructive material. I'm very alarmed when I hear the number of Christians who have read books by people like Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins and Bart Ehrman without having first read good, solid Christian defenses of the Christian faith. And these people are like sitting ducks when they go and read that material. I don't think you should expose yourself to that kind of skeptical, atheistic literature until you are well-equipped to give a solid, positive defense of the fundamental truth of the Christian faith. And once you're equipped to do that, then, and only then, is it time to go and begin to read the atheist and skeptical literature, and then the deficits and logical gaps in the arguments will become very apparent. You know, I can't help but think about the idea of inoculation, of stress training. Uh, you know, I've been, as in law enforcement, I've been sprayed with pepper spray. I've been uh, in the military. We go into those gas chambers where they expose you. But the idea is, is that I have first done the preparatory work before I then go into battle. Uh, and that is so common to what we're talking about here. I have prepared myself in training. So yeah. that when I go into the battle of ideas, uh, I, I don't get overcome. You know, some Christians, they read those books and then they're overwhelmed with, oh, they are. I didn't know there was no evidence. I didn't know the, that... Um, this or that these crazy theories they think well i didn't know that there's no way to answer this and that festering thorn of doubt can do real damage so to the parents and, and to the youth uh start with good solid work i can't recommend reasonable faith enough start with good solid work of course start with reading your bible you know you, we talk about don't if you if you've never read your entire bible you you may want to start with that in in uh, simultaneously with starting the apologetics works because um, it's impressive how many folks just haven't read their Bible. Yeah. So uh, there's a, there's a lot of work to do, but there, you know, I take solace in the idea that um, just like starting this company, uh, G God provides. Uh, he provides the words. He provides the focus. He because it's you know when you start this work. That's the last thing the devil wants you to do, is to get involved in your faith and to begin to really take it seriously. And so you're going to feel tired. You're going to feel distracted. Uh, suddenly, I can't focus for ten minutes, but I can scroll. I can scroll on <laughs> Facebook or Twitter for an hour, 
um, without a problem. So I encourage you as parents to um, take captive those thoughts. In fact, uh, one of your favorite verses, Dr. Craig, it focuses on that. Is, isn't that correct? Are you thinking of 2 Corinthians 10.5? Yes, sir. Yes. There Paul says um, that we destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. And to me, that embodies uh, the ministry that I'm involved in. Um, to Dr. Craig, I want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to sit down with you. Uh, I've just, I've, I, I can't believe we're here. You know, I have to pinch myself a little bit to say thank you for this opportunity to sit with you and get to hear um, your thoughts and for you to pour out in a, in a different sense into these families that are going to hear this and see this uh, to encourage them. Any last words uh, for parents or for their youth? Well, I hope that parents who've been listening to us don't feel under the pile after our discussion. We, we've laid a lot of heavy uh, things on the parents today, but I want to emphasize what a joy it is to see your children walking in the truth. And as they grow older and uh, through those teenage years and become young adults, as our children have, it's a tremendous joy. Uh, in uh, Third John, the author uh, says, uh, no greater joy can I have than this, than to see that my children walk in the truth. And that's true of biological children as well as spiritual children too. So um, don't don't be under the pile about all that we've said and uh, because the rewards are great and the joys are great. Amen. What a wonderful thing to say. I often tell parents if they've seen Rocky, which I've seen a hundred times, Mick, <laughs> Mick, the coach, is hard on Rocky, not because he wants to hurt Rocky's feelings, but because he loves him, and he wants yeah. him to win and be victorious. And so I think Dr. Craig and I both want you to win and be victorious uh, in your kingdom work and in your first ministry at home uh, with your children. So thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, what a joy it is to see our children walk in truth, and uh, thank yeah. you for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, and, and keep up the good work. 